Good. How are you feeling? Yeah, listen, this is wonderful because we are here to listen to a, a lesson on Thrive, the Power of Positive Expectancy. I want, to, I want to invite you to look back at your bulletin because at the back of the bulletin is readings that you got there. And we, we see Jesus is talking about every good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, fire and thus by their fruit you will know them or recognize them. I want you to know that we don't... Scripture is a lot of poetry. And just because Jesus said this tree and that tree, yes, it means at one level this tree and that tree, but the deeper reflection comes when you are able to go beneath what the surface meaning is, what the tree symbolizes. And even though he doesn't say the tree of life, which is the kind of tree that you refer back into the story of Eden, what he's saying is that we have within us this aspect to bring this tree of life our special life to this life for all of us. And when we do, then we are in alignment with the ground of our being. Our roots go deep into some aspect of ourselves that knows what to do, when to do it, where to do it, and how to do it, and is forever doing it, but we do not see it. As Jesus once said, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth and men do not see it. This is from the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, which is not one of the canons, but these are gospels discovered at Nagamari and at this more current time in our last century. But I want you to know that you are that tree you're that tree which has the potential for good fruits. And I don't just mean good fruits by conforming to societal standards only. Yes, we're going to have to all do a little of that. What I'm talking about is the very special gift that you have within you to share with all life. And we're going to be covering some of that in our talk. And when we look at Ernest Holmes' statement here, and for those of you who are not familiar with Ernest Holmes, he wrote The Science of Mind, and we call ourselves Religious Science or The Science of Mind, where you must understand that science simply means the way something works. That's all science means. And mind is another word for God. So what are we looking at? We're looking at how God works in the world. And God works in the world through laws, the law of gravity, the law of giving and receiving, the law of love. All these things, the law of forgiveness. These are spiritual or mental laws that when we begin to understand them, we will also understand that they can be creative laws, creative laws that even when you look at your situation and it doesn't seem possible that you can do the things that you think you ought to do, it is possible. That's something we will cover today too. So Ernest Holmes is saying that we should work not with anxiety. Stop being fretful. Do not be fearful of what you may eat or what you may drink the Father. Isn't it interesting that Jesus said the Father? And what have we done? We take the fact that Jesus said, my Father or our Father, as uniquely Jesus' Father. That's what most people do. And so we must be stepchildren. And I don't know where stepchildren come from. Of course, when Jesus did a prayer, he says, our Father. 
But what I want you to leave with today is that when you come into the awareness that God is your father or slash mother, father, mother, God, however you want to do it, but I don't want to get too lost from the scripture. When you get to the point where you understand that you can make a claim in this relational world, because that's what the world is. It's all about relationship. It's relational. That God is my father, which doesn't mean God is not your father. When Jesus said, God is my father, Abba, he's not saying God is not your father, because he does say our father. He didn't say my father that uh, can consider you from time to time if you well behave. He doesn't say that. Does he say that? It's our Father. But we don't make the claim. We don't make the claim of this cosmic relationship of being one with the universe. And so we disempower ourselves from the creative flow that we see exhibited in Jesus. These things I do, but others will, be, will do even greater than these because I go to the Father. When your eye, the eye that is you, goes to the Father, it makes all the difference in the world in terms of what you're creating. What are you creating? What is it that your life feels like within yourself? That it can be, must be, and will be if you have the right relationship with that spirit of the entire universe. God is not a God of the Christian religion or the Jewish religion or the Taoist religion or the Hindu religion. God is a God of the universe. And this planet is a little tiny thing like a mote of dust in this vast universe. Can you imagine the ants deciding that God is only a God of the ants? And what about the mosquitoes? What about everything else? What we need to understand is God is the God of the universe, but we call him this kind of God because we're seeing it through cultural lenses. Cultural lenses. We put blinders on it, and those people don't know what they're talking about. We're the only ones who want to know what we're talking about. So when we talk about thriving, we want to understand that life is the most optimistic thing that there is. Life. The most of this, this thing called life should never have happened. <laughs> Think about how incredible you are. When you go to the doctor, you can't even go to one doctor anymore. You go for, with one concern and they send you to 10 specialists out there. Why? Because they can't, there's no one that can completely fathom the immensity of the universe that is in you and as you. This is what you're dealing with. This is an amazing reality for each one of us. And so life is amazingly optimistic. And in the Hebrew Bible, Jeremiah in 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you. He's quoting God, he's speaking for God. A prophet is not just somebody who tells the future. That's what people think a prophet is. A prophet is one who speaks for God. Do you see the difference? It's not like somebody said, well, it's a fortune teller. Let me tell you what's going to happen. A prophet is one who speaks for God. That's what a prophet is. And he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. We make this big deal about the present moment as if the present moment is all there is. We're not living just to live in the present moment. We're living to enjoy the present moment with the idea that there is a future that we're looking forward to. And Freud says whenever you lose a sense of the future pathology, which means mental problems and physical problems set in. 
pathology, death, disease. So what I'm saying to you is that there is this sense of expectancy, it's a law of expectancy that we should have about life. Don't get up in your foxhole every day and say, oh my God, I better not turn around here before a bullet gets me. So the, the, he's talking about for welfare, God is making a plan for welfare, which means a sense of your life being wonderful and great and fulfilled and not for evil. In other words, not for the negation of life. So we're in this little foxhole ducking all the time, the bullets coming. This Don't spend your time ducking from bullets. What you need to do is to spend your time knowing how you're coming forward out of this foxhole despite, despite all the problems that you may see. And I tell you why. Because God has given you a future and a hope. In other words, certainty. There is something about expectancy that ties in with certainty. And it's not a certainty that is always, I, I'm always stressing you must have planned, you must have vision and plan and so on. This kind of expectancy doesn't require that. It doesn't even require faith. It's different from faith. It's a certainty about this is who I am. This is what I'm bringing forward. There's a certainty about it. Let's, let's, let's look at Sidney Poitier. Do you remember him? He was my buddy. No, it wasn't. But here is here's this, this fellow. He was born in America, but he's Bahamian, and he went back to Bahamas, and he came back here, you know, kind of not very educated, all semi-illiterate. And he went into Miami to work as a messenger. He delivered stuff like they're doing with Amazon, I suppose, now, but on a different level. And it was a time of, of terrible discrimination. He comes to this house. He rings the bell. He says, Mom, I have this package for you. The woman said, get to the back door. And he was shocked. And he said, Mom, I'm, I'm here, and here's the package. Get to the back door. And he put the package down, and he left, and he never went back to the job. He went to, to um, New York, and then he decided that he was going to go to this workshop, a black workshop, to learn how to act. And after a couple of times going there, the black director threw him out and told him, go get a, go get a, a job washing plates, washing dishes, because he couldn't read. And when he was walking away, he said, oh my God, I already have a job washing dishes. He goes back, and he's washing his dishes, but when he gets a break, he would take up the times and he would try to read. And a Jewish waiter noticed his trouble, and he said, I can help you. And he helped Sidney Poitier to read. And finally, Sidney Poitier went back. And voila, great actor, Academy Award. What I'm saying to you is there was a certainty about him that didn't match all the, the circumstances around him. But in that certainty about who he was, he continued and he didn't allow himself to just shrink in the insults to what he thought he was and what he really was. He came out of it. And I want you to know when you have a sense of expectancy, that certainty comes up on you and it is for your positive good, not for evil, and it is for your future, not just the present moment. Don't judge your life by the present moment. The present can only tell you where you are. It cannot determine where you can go. The present can only tell you where you are. It doesn't determine where you can go. And when you have a sense of expectancy, there's a transformation in the universe of everything working together for good. You hear these terms all the time, but you don't apply them to yourself. All things work together for good for them that love God. 
And the love of God doesn't have to always mean I am focusing on the personality of God. I'm also focusing on the good that I have to bring out because it is God in me, as me, working through me for everyone. Well, you begin to see it that way. You're shifting gears and you're making yourself ready for the big work because the law of expectancy is working with the consciousness of certainty. Certainty. And all of you have talents and dreams and aspiration. And what you have to do is to begin to believe that I can. And then let it go and start doing the things that will get you there to move out of negative acceptances, which is like coming into a room that is dark and not turning on the light, or coming into a room that is well lit and turning off the light. That's what your negative thoughts will do for your gifts, your talents. You can. I can. I shall. I must. And there is nothing in the universe that is preventing that from occurring in your life. Nothing besides your belief, besides the action that you're taking. So when you look at your life, my friends, you may hear Ernest Holmes saying, a state of expectancy is a great asset. A state of uncertainty, one moment thinking, perhaps, the next moment thinking, I don't know, will never get the desired results. You cannot be vacillating. You must be embracing. You must be committing every day to your greatest good in some measure. Whatever that greatest good is in each day, Participate in it in some measure. And yes, there may be disappointments along the way. Life, just because you pray, doesn't prevent you from getting pains and disappointments. But all these things can work together for good if you don't take them on as the universe being against you or somebody being against you. Take them on as, what is the lesson? How do I go from here to where I need to be? The universe doesn't always have to say yes for every venture. Sometimes no is the right answer. Although I know some preachers in our faith says, the universe always says yes. But I'm saying to you that the universal mind the spirit which we call God, is forever putting before you options for you to find your path. But if you don't ever spend the time contemplating in reflection, in prayer, then it will all pass away and it won't matter. But when you begin to feel it, you'll begin to see it. And you hear other people say, say or, or compose or do things. You said, how did they do that? And they did that because they're seeing something that you haven't seen. There's none so blind as she who will not see. So this present is your launching pad. It is where you push off from into that dream that is part of who you are. And when you come to into that dream, that dream is your big thing that I talked about last week. Doing your big thing. Don't lose your big thing. Yes, there are going to be struggles sometimes, but don't get your emotions wrapped up in it. Get to a point where you can relax. I've been watching these young people getting ready for the Olympics. And it's really 
excruciating, I would imagine, for some of them. And yet they have to find a way to relax and to do what they do the best they can. And what they're doing is exemplifying what we ourselves have to do with our lives. Find a way to relax. Be still and know that I am God. I am of you is the I am of God. The I am that was declared to Moses when God, when he asked God, who must I tell Pharaoh has sent me? And God said, I am. So when you think about you, yourself, say to yourself, today I choose to increase my happiness and success by winning at my life. There's nothing wrong with winning as I talk about the athletes. There's only something wrong with winning when we think we have to do something bad to somebody. But winning, competing, is really part of our talents. That's why we admire it so and pay so much money to watch athletes and other people do these things. Everyone, sometimes, <coughs> sometimes in religion, we said, well, you shouldn't be competing. You should be cooperating. Well, there's a time for cooperating and there's a time for, for uh, competing. And I'm glad we competed hard to get that, uh, that vaccine that we needed. And because we did, now we can export it to other places that didn't get to develop it because they don't, just don't know how. So it can be a good thing. Don't make it a bad thing. Don't make everything a bad thing. You know, Tony, and Tony Robbins says, if you want to direct, if we want to direct our lives, we must take control of our consistent actions. It is not what we do once in a while that shapes our lives, but what we do consistently. So I ask you, in your big dream, in your big thing, is there consistency? And is there prayer to support it? That's what you ought to do. And when you do the prayer, it's not that the prayer is magical. What a prayer is, it's relational. It is getting God and God's laws to work in with who you are by your degree of acceptance. That is why Jesus said, by your faith be it done unto you. We live in a relational world and all things must be working together for good if we are to experience welfare, wellness, well-being. I didn't say perfection because I don't think this life is about perfection, it's about excellence. Perfection doesn't change. But it's all right when you're praying, you want to say, well, I want to be whole perfect and complete. That's fine. But what you mean by perfection is probably not what I mean by perfection and not somebody else means by perfection. In fact, my perfection seems to change every day. I don't know about yours, but it's good. That's why I love the fact that in the Hebrew Bible, it says life is good. I like good. I can relate to good. Because good are stages of being better or being worse, and that's what the, my experience is of life. I don't experience a steady state life where nothing is changing. I experience a life where everything changes in every single moment, and science has backed that up. Things come into being and perish in the same moment. The whole universe is like that, and you and I are part of that. So creation... It's not a one-time event. It's an ongoing event, and you can create your life because of that. Creation is an ongoing event. So this moment is a moment where you can create again. You can begin to redream your life. You can begin to change on the inside, and it shall reflect on the outside.
I want to give you a few steps that you can use to thrive the power of positive expectancy. You should reflect on what you really want with life and lock it in. Feel confident about it. Feel certain about it. <clears throat> you should use the law of expectation, which is the law of optimism. Don't get, go keep going up and down. No matter how bad things look, bring yourself back to optimism. It's not easy, but it's like exercise. Exercise is not easy. But then when you exercise, you look big and muscular like me. So you can look who laughed over there. Would you take that person's name? Um, I want you to know that you are spiritually gifted to do what you need to do. That's why Genesis 1 said, you're made in the image of God. You must be fruitful and multiply. And you must have dominion over your world. Your world, not the world, your world. You can do that. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. You want more than that? You are immensely gifted to do what you want to do. The fifth thing is, accept your freedom from within and not the fatalism of your present circumstance. Accept the freedom that is within and let go the sense of fatalism that may present itself in your present circumstance. And finally, I want to remind you of the words of our uh, prophet. Um, I'm losing his name. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. He says, For I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. The plans include certainty, positive good, which is welfare, not evil. A future, which means not just this moment, but a launching pad to the greater yet to be that is all you. God bless you all.